The foundation of a society is made up of the strength of the family unit within that society. If each family is strong and united, the nation will be strong. Last week we were looking at family, but if it's made up of broken homes and broken lives, we can really only expect a fractured society and a weak nation. Think of our scripture, Psalm 33, 12. It says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Well, in the Roman Empire, there were believed to be 60 million slaves. Wow. Apparently, up to half the population were slaves. Even doctors were considered slaves, too. Well, many of those 60 million slaves would have been within households, which is why this is within that part that talks uh, to households, wives, husbands, children. Just to make it clear, the Bible doesn't support or condone slavery. Lots of people say, oh, there's so much about slaves in the Bible, and it doesn't say that it's wrong. <coughs> it's clearly at a different time, a different era of history. Uh, but in one sense, it's simply accepted that we're not all on the same status, on the same level, even if we are equally valuable as Christians. Now, Paul couldn't speak out against slavery itself, or he'd be in danger of causing uproar, of an uprising. You can imagine, can't you, if he would be being seen as a political rebel, a lot of resentment towards those above them in positions of authority would come about. So instead, he did the very opposite. He sanctified the duty of work and even the unpaid work of a slave. It's a bit like Jesus did, oftentimes, where people came to trick him and trap him, thinking, well, it's either this or this. And he went, no, there's another way. There's another way. So he sanctified work in itself. Here's a question for you. What's the quality of your work like when no one but God is watching? What's your work like when no one but God is watching? Nobody else can see you, but of course God can. It's no accident that the Lord is mentioned in these five verses five times. It is before him that we do everything. There are no secrets to the Lord. Hebrews 4.13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So rather than acting as though he doesn't exist or doesn't know us and all that we're doing, wouldn't it actually be better to embrace the truth that he does know? He knows all about us. Now, some take that knowledge that God is watching them, and then they think of him as someone who's waiting to be angry at their behaviour. But no, it's far from that. That is not the intended purpose and not the intended response of God telling you that he knows all things. The Lord wants you to do well. He made you. He wants you. He didn't make you to crush you. He made you to thrive, to grow and to thrive. The Lord wants you to rest in him, to be contented in him, to work for him, so that he is the one that we are most conscious of. Nearly 100 years ago, uh, Eric Liddell, the Olympic runner and, and champion, uh, he left a sports career to become a missionary in China. That's his parents' work. And he said this, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. Mm. That's a lovely testimony, isn't it, in itself? I think that's a lot of fullness of his testimony. I feel his pleasure. And isn't it good to know that God delights in you? Now, for some of you today, before you work unto the Lord, you must be in the Lord, for you are not yet born again of his spirit. What's born again? To be born again? Well, Jesus outlined this in John chapter 3. The story is that a man came to Jesus at night. And he was a teacher. He was a very important teacher. Perhaps he didn't want to be seen. 
by anybody, particularly not the people he was best known to. Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be born again. He didn't understand it. He thought, well, how can I climb back into my mother's womb and come out a second time? He didn't understand it. He thought he meant a physical act, but no. Jesus said, flesh gives birth to flesh. In other words, your mother gave birth to you. But the spirit gives birth to spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who gives birth to the Holy Spirit in you. And that's what must happen to you. And you know, he couldn't get his head around it at the time. But he became a follower of Jesus. He stuck up for Jesus when all his colleagues were saying bad things about him. He was later involved in the burial of Jesus. And we believe that he became a believer in Jesus. But that's just one person. The person who was first told about being born again. Since then, thousands, indeed millions of people all over the world over the last 2,000 years have become Christians and have been born again. Their natures have been changed. They've gone from saying... I don't care about God. I don't care about his creation. I don't care about what is to come. To it becoming, him becoming the most important person in their life. Well, after you've been born again, then, when, you're, when you know the Lord, and when you're definitely in his family, you can truly live for him. Now, when you meet somebody of working age for the first time, What's one of the first questions you ask them? After you get to know their name, what's the first thing you ask them after that? What do you do? It is always that, isn't it? And we want to define people, categorise them, perhaps we want to get a better picture of them. What do you do? What work do you do? Let's find out what kind of thing they're up to in the, in the nine to five or whatever hours they work. Or if they're retired from work, maybe you want to find out what the job they did. Now let's read, what does it say here? Verse 22 of Colossians chapter three. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. You see there then, when only God is watching. And this is talking to slaves and we know that there are so many slaves, and, and it would have been, I mean, we're not slaves now, are we? If, we you know, if you get a minimum wage, you're not a slave, are you? You still get a minimum wage. But these people would have simply got a board and lodgings and nothing more. They wouldn't have had even pocket money. Verse 23, this is really key. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. So when we read that, it seems to be far more about what you do, sorry, how you do what you do, rather than simply what you do. How you do it is more important than what you do. So oftentimes when we're coming to people and saying, what do you do, we're kind of bypassing the whole of this, this whole philosophy that all this passage is based around it's all about the Lord, not about what you do, it's who you're doing it for. And as long as what we do is not immoral, our attitude to our work is the most important thing about it. I'll read 23 again. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. To put it in plain English, Every Christian works for the best boss there is. Now I understand that we need to earn a certain amount of money to afford to pay our rent or a mortgage place to live. And I understand that some of the people have great drive and ambition, uh, determination to succeed, to be in the best job that they can. We're not all made like that. But we should thank the Lord for any opportunities that he opens up to us. He knows 
He knows our needs far better than we do. We need to remember that. He will provide. So let's share the Apostle Paul's confidence as he says in Philippians 4, 19, My God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Uh, when I was a railway chaplain, uh, there was a, a driver's manager uh, who I was, uh, knew, knew reasonably well. I probably didn't see him that often, maybe, um, I'd say, five times a year, five, six times a year. Um, now, just to explain, a driver's manager was somebody who had perhaps 25 or so drivers underneath them. He was responsible for them. And this wasn't an easy job because it meant that if, if there were any mistakes made by those drivers, that it would come back to that driver's manager, as it were. Why haven't you trained him enough? Why haven't you why aren't you monitoring him enough? So he was very much there for the care of those drivers. If there was a, a fatality on the railway, it would be the driver's manager who was going to the site of that scene and putting his arm effectively around the shoulder of the driver, but then driving the train away, taking taking that duty on from them. And I particularly noticed the strain or the, pot the potential for strain that the driver's managers were under, and so I used to take particular care to go to see the driver's managers in each of the depots quite regularly. But this is one particular guy um, in the Cambridge depot, and, and he was talking uh, about this whole thing of, I want the, these drivers, because they drive on their own, don't they, all the time. So I want them to drive so that they've, they've got a sense of, of, of doing the right thing all the time, whether, whether I'm there or not. And I said, oh, I know, I know a scripture verse like that. <laughs> and, uh, and I've got my, got my uh, Bible out. And, and I shared with him this, this verse and these verses. And his eyes lit up. And he, oh, that's, that's amazing. He, he, he actually wanted it kind of on the cab or something inside the driver's cab, something crazy like that. So he loved the concept. He wanted his drivers to, to really live this out. And I admired his passion. But I knew deep down that those train drivers, they would have to belong to the Lord themselves to truly understand this and live this out. They couldn't do it otherwise. Otherwise, it's just what the manager's telling them to do. Yeah. Whereas when we are with this knowledge and in, indeed with the power from the Lord to do, to, to do this, to live this out, it's an altogether different thing, isn't it? I wonder if you've ever said, it's not fair about your work. It's not fair because the boss notices that person and not me. They promote my colleague who doesn't work as hard as I do uh, instead of me. They don't see all the hard work that I do. Have you ever said that? Well, this broken world is full of injustice, of things being unfair. And of course, we do believe in a day of ultimate reckoning. But for those who believe they're overlooked and underappreciated or unappreciated, this verse 23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, that should actually come as a sense of ah, relief. There's no need to justify ourselves because God sees when nobody else does. God sees all the hard work that you do. And yet we must do our work for him, for his sake, and with his strength working in us. Verse 24 says this, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. That's good, isn't it? Again, a relief because the Lord will repay as only he knows how. We do not know what this reward will be, but if it's from the Lord, we know that it will be well worth having. And at the end of 24, in a separate sentence, on its own, it says, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. As if we haven't got the point yet to drive it home a bit more. Yeah? It is the Lord Christ you are serving. That's 
important. Think of the encouragement that would have given to a first century slave working all hours of the day for a hard boss probably unable to get to a service a gathering like this when they wanted to think of how our working lives will be transformed if we keep this thought before us it is the Lord Christ we are serving we think of that all the time that we are doing things it is for his sake Verse 25, anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong and there is no favouritism. It's a solemn reminder that God is the one that we all answer to, no matter how powerful we think we are, or the other way around, if we are unimportant, we think we're so unimportant that no one will notice the wrong that we've ever done. But God sees, God knows. But what if you're not one of the workers, what if you're the boss? <clears throat> the Colossians 4 verse 1 addresses that too. Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Capital M for master there. God himself. So God gives us a word from the Lord to the boss. Again, the language is of master and servant, but it can be easily transferred to a modern setting of a boss and an employee. So to be right and fair, he says, to be right and fair, no exploitation, however menial their work is, that slave, that servant, that worker, is God's handiwork brought into being to live for the glory of God. As we, as we said, the value is the value that God put on you in the beginning. And we're all valuable to him, aren't we? Every single one of us. Paul appeals to the boss's conscience. He says, you know, you know you also have a master in heaven. He's talking to Christians here. But he's saying, you know that you have a master in heaven. It's a great leveller, knowing that everyone, from the boss of Tesco's to the person employed to clean their toilets, all are under God, all are answerable to him. It's an old cliche, with great power comes great responsibility, but it's true, it's true, yeah. But that doesn't mean, that really doesn't mean that you'll slip under God's radar if you haven't got a top job, yeah. We're all accountable to God, just some of us more so than others. Yeah? It's not that oh he's got to he's got to give an account because he's the boss, but because I'm only an employee, I don't have to say anything. No, we're all accountable to God. It's clear that God doesn't want you to resent your work. Uh, Martin Luther, now he lived a long time ago, five hundred years ago. So a different setting. But Martin Luther said, a dairy maid can milk cows to the glory of God. Mm. And I'm sure that you can do your work to the glory of God too. Well, I've talked about working for a long time. And this might have bound you up because maybe you're not in work and you want to be. You're wanting to work, but you don't have any. And I say to you, pray to the Lord that he causes you to learn new things at this time of waiting. Ask him to make you ready for whatever he wants you to do. And whoever we are, the Lord needs to be your Lord. Yeah? We all need to be born again of his spirit. The Lord wants you to do well and to do your best. And remembering that he phrase, that key sentence there, it is the Lord Christ we are serving. That is a comfort, isn't it? It's a release, a relief, and something we should always remember that helps us to do our best and it helps us to work without resentment and with joy. Whether people are noticing or not, we know that God always does. Let's pray together. 
and we thank you, Lord, for all that you've written here in your word for us. We pray that we would be very much guided by this. Thank you, Lord, for everyone here, the value you put on us. And we pray, Lord, that we would put a, a very heavy value, a big value on the fact that you notice all that we do. We thank you that we can live our lives knowing that nothing is wasted. All the work that we do for you will be noted. Thank you, Lord, that we can work indeed for you. We can serve you. Thank you that you've invited us to serve, to work alongside you. Lord, I pray that we, as we leave this place, we would be different people. Oftentimes we can come to a service expecting something pleasant, nice, whatever word we might use. But Father, please challenge us and help us to remember what we have learned or be reminded of. We praise you, Lord, for each one of us here. We pray that we might do each other good. We're not yet, if uh, people here are not yet in your family, I pray that they would very soon know your nearness, your ability to bring them into your family, the need to be convicted of that. Lord, we pray for any who have strayed and need to be brought back and backslidden. We pray that you bring them truly into the centre of your fold and know your nearness and your company along the narrow way. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <coughs> Going to be singing an old hymn uh, to end with Take Time.